1990, people were, couldn't even even say the word ciabatta. Ciabatta. <laughs> focaccia in English. They, oh, they were too scared to say, fuck, fuck, focaccia. Only caccia. Caccia. What? Fuck. What? So funny. You go, you go to a meeting with the supermarket and say, we want some focaccia. <laughs> Focaccia. The what? The, the, the Italian brand will start with F. <laughs> ah, focaccia. <gasps> no! <laughs> Esta es una conversación con Richard Bertinet, el creador del método Bertinet, también conocido como el método amasado francés. Richard es una eminencia de la panadería. Su trabajo ha resultado en premios que incluyen el BBC Food Champion of the Year y una gran cantidad de reconocimientos por sus libros Dog y Crust, los cuales fueron traducidos a más de 70 idiomas revolucionando la panadería casera a nivel mundial. En esta conversación hablamos acerca de los avances en la calidad del pan en los últimos 30 años. Nos explicó el origen del método amasado que lleva su nombre, opinó acerca de las nuevas tendencias en la panadería y nos reveló qué es lo que considera un croissant perfecto. Hablamos acerca del éxito mundial de sus libros y hasta nos respondió si considera rentable tener una panadería hoy en día. Este es el Gluten Podcast y es presentado a ustedes gracias a nuestros sponsors que podrán encontrar en la descripción de este programa. Ahora con ustedes, Richard Bertinet. Richard, welcome to the Gluten Podcast. Oh, well, welcome. And thank you, for, <laughs> thank you for having us here in, at your kitchen, here yes. in Bath. My bath, uh, my bath, my pleasure, thank you. <laughs> in the wrong day. <laughs> this is strange because we should be recording this podcast in French. Because no. English is not our mother tongue, neither yours, neither... Uh, is uh, French your mother tongue? <laughs> no. <laughs> exactly, that's why. <laughs> but we will try. We will try to do our effort for you to understand us. Yeah. That's okay? Sorry, what did you say? <laughs> <laughs> Bonjour. Yeah, that's good. Let's move on. <laughs> so, Richard, in, the, in this podcast, we continue a, a chronological order. So, we have to start asking you, how did you become a baker? Um, because I put my hand up at school. Mm. I was very stupid at school. Well, not stupid, I was dyslexic, but in my, when I was young, we didn't know dyslexia. So I was not very bright. Uh, I didn't like school, I couldn't learn. I couldn't learn English with a French teacher. I couldn't, mm. some subject didn't make sense. Um, so one day they had, on the blackboard, they had all different jobs on the blackboard and everybody in the classroom chose The cleverest one choose the job first. Doctor. And, and, yeah, doctor, avocat, you know, it's just like, uh, it's, I was the last in the class, like, oh God, all the job left. And then the two <laughs> jobs left, me and my friend were together, army and baker. Like, <laughs> okay. So we thought army, we were too young for that. So I put my hand up for baker. So I became a baker. And then I went to the army anyway. So oh, yeah. um, how old were you when you started uh, baking? 14. 14. Yeah. But you had no idea about baking. Not really. I, I, you ate bread. Yeah. Oh, in France, you eat bread every day. <laughs> so, you know, I, I used to queue in the, in the shop every morning, in the morning or whenever we buy bread, the weekend, you know. So bread, was, bread in France is part of your life. You can't sit for lunch, dinner or breakfast without bread. It's impossible. Yeah. So bread is something you, you... You have in your blood. It's in your blood, in a way, in your mouth all the time. And I, I always remember vividly when I was a kid, you know, um, going to my local bakery, and especially on a Sunday, Big queue in the shop, you queue and you queue and you queue. And what were you queuing? You look in the shop and everything. I always remember that sometimes the door of the, the funnel, the, the, the bake house at the back, used to be open and then you could see the baker working. And they used to bring the bread in the shop, you know, they put their apron, cross it, you know, and look proper. And they always had that pride of, of themselves going to the shop, putting the bread there. Everybody was looking at them. And um, they were covering flour, tired, and everything. Mm -hmm. else. I said, I would hate that job. <laughs> I just wonder for myself in that place, you know. But I remember the pride I had to go and push the trolley into the shop with bread smelling fresh. Everybody would look at it and smell it, you know. So I think when you're young at 14, 15, you, you, you work hard. I mean, on those days, there was no working four hours. You, you work eight, ten hours. You didn't complain. And you hate the job because it's so hard. But at the same time, you learn. You learn the, the foundation. And then... My friend were, you know, working as a mechanic or you know, doing nine to five, Monday to Friday. So they used to go out on Friday night and Saturday, com come completely drunk at four o'clock after clubbing all night, you know, come and knock on the door of the bakery to buy croissant. I was like, oh, I hate you, go away, you know. Uh, and they go to bed now, you know. Oh, so by the time they wake up, that's the time I used to go to bed. So yeah. it's a hard life when you're young, you know. But it's, uh, I guess... Like eating bread, when you start working with it, the smell, everything becomes part of you and it's very hard to get away with it. So 
And of course, after that, yeah, I went in the army. Yeah, I spent two years in the army and then left, went back to work in the bakery, did different things. But what what uh, bakery product do you remember doing at the 14-year-old that we were on this time? I used to love working on the oven. That's a picture of you. I've seen the yeah, picture of you. Says, yeah, yeah. You still had hair like, oh, like yeah. For me. me, the discipline <laughs> of my boss, you know, the, the voice is still there all the time, you know. I remember when I was 16, I burned a whole trolley of, of bread mm. and it took it off my wages. <coughs> oh. oh, I was earning 20 pounds, you know. It was like, mm. So five pounds was out. It's like, mm. that's a lot, you know. You couldn't do that now. But you learn to respect everything, you know. You, you, if you're tired, you're going to pay the price for it. Okay. So it's, um, but I never, mixing the dough, weighing the ingredients, I never liked it as dyslexia for you. But working in the oven, loading the oven, being, t you know, being aware of your time, cutting the baguette. I cut a ton of baguettes. I <laughs> never get bored of it, you know. When I open the door and they're all, what we call like hush, and they're all yeah. bursting, I still get excited about it, even now. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. so when I teach now and, and they make good baguettes and they come out of the oven and they're all smiling, yeah. I get so happy. You, and when you, you get never it, tired of that. You can't. It's every impressive. time I open yeah. my Dutch oven, yeah. I open it. Yeah. 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 Because yes. it's different every time, right? Yeah, it's, it's magic. Well, it's, it's, it's expectation. You know it's going to mm. be good, but so when yeah. you teach people, you want them to have the same sensation. Yeah. And if the baguettes are crap coming or not very good, as we say, you know, uh, when they cut out of the oven, then people just, oh, yeah, it's fine. But I know they can do better. So yeah. I, I try to push all the time that the discipline to make baguette start right from the beginning, right to the end, and you have to be focused on that. Okay. Because when you get a good baguette coming out of the oven, the pleasure, you know, the satisfaction you've got never mm. leave you. And that's what keeps you going baking all the time. Uh, okay. Yeah. And spare you. So. It's also like a meditation, right? When you're working with the dogs? It's no, like, not for me. For no, people, no. yes. For me, it's, it's work. <laughs> uh -huh. But it's it like you being in the present, right? Which is the main point of meditation. You are living there and you don't think about anything else. I think, mm -hmm. yes and no. I think when, when, when I'm teaching, I'm focused on people. Mm -hmm. For me, being with dough is normal. Okay, if there's something wrong with that, I think about it. But um, I, For me, it's um, it's uh, it's like teaching a language to people. So I, I, it's like a way of communicating with people. And I, I, I learn through the door how to deal with people. It's hard to explain, you know, it's, uh, when I teach people. But there's there's something with dough that when you when your finger are in there, it's very hard to think of anything else. So I think of my job, of course, but it's very hard to think of something completely different. So it's a dough is a kind of a, it's a funny. There's, the dough is very unique. There's nothing else like dough. You know, when you stick to your fingers, it's you got to deal with it. Um, so it's, a, it's it's an interesting process, really. Mm. Nothing to make you happy when you know that I, uh, it happens to me. When I know that I have a whole b b bunch of bread to bake on the next day, or I have a bulk fermenting in the fridge, and oh, tomorrow I have to make some baguettes, and that's it's like a oh yeah yeah it's no, an I incredible I sensation. Fridge, yeah. mm -hmm. And I love sometimes coming in the morning and there's nobody in the, in the kitchen. Yeah. So I get my dough out, shape it, put the oven on, you know. And I love that. It's like that silence, which I love. Yes. And when the bread come out and you can't help yourself, you take a crunch and they're all bursting. <laughs> yeah. You smile, you know, you can't. Yeah. It doesn't matter how many times you make bread. I see that's, people ask me, are you bored doing, doing what you're doing? Mm. No. Nope. Okay. You know, the oh. day I get bored of excitement, then I stop, you know, but for the moment it's, The pleasure I give you inside and the pleasure I give to people is quite... Uh, yeah. I think people also happen to them that when they, they make their own bread, they tell me, hey, it is the best sensation that I could ever oh, give. Yeah. It's interesting. I think when I teach people now what's, what's keeping me going, the bread, yes, but the emotion mm. with people. Yeah, yes. I see people crying. I see people absolutely change their life because they spend time with me in here. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I take it for granted sometimes, but you, you get... Email from people who would be here 10 years ago who opened a bakery and make success because they, or they bought my book and they start changing their life. And you just think, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But when you happen all the time, all the time, all the time, you just think, wow, you've done something right. So it's strange to be proud of what you're doing, but sometimes you've got to step back and say, actually, you've done something good for people. And then, you know, be proud of your achieve. So it's, uh, it's, um, that's what keeps you going because you never know. You know, when I teach people, I always think it's like a new game, it's like a new pack of cards. And every time you play card, you go to new, new <laughs> sets and you go to deal with those people all the time. So okay. it's a kind of a, um, you go to adapt your teaching style to the class you've got. You've got some quiet class, some different people from all over the world. So you go to adapt all the time. Okay. Uh, and that's the teaching element add, will, will be better when I understand the people I'm working with.
Okay. Because I want people to have fun first. If they don't have, if they're stressed, they won't learn nothing. So you got to have that fun, um, take the fear away, and and just they get their their brain free to learn. Uh, okay. So you spend one day with me or five days, then. Yeah, it's a, I see the transformation. It's, a, it's okay. phenomenal. That experience mm -hmm. is uh, here in the Bertinet kitchen. Yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, we, we create baking, learning, eating. You bake, you learn, but you eat. So it's a kind of, I used <laughs> to run restaurants. So the hospitality is everything also. From okay. the moment you arrive, you make people feel welcome. To the moment they leave, they want to come back. Okay. That's that's a, the, the main thing. So <laughs> the whole experience. It's an experience from, from start to finish. Great. So, so you were telling us that you went to the army, right? So yep. in... You went to army and then in France was uh, in France, yeah. In France, yeah. In okay. the French Marines. So I did two, two, two and a half years, two years in the French Marines. Okay. Did that experience help you in the future baking uh, in with something or? No, no, it was different. So. But did you bake there at the army? No. Yeah. Ah. No, no. no, no. But mm. for example, maybe some some but experience may help uh, you during I don't know when you open a new business or. Yeah, everything you do in life, good or bad. It's an experience. So if you do a job and you don't like it, you leave it as three months, you learn something. And that's the key of thing. It's, uh, so when I did the army, I nearly signed for 10 years. You know, I, I loved it. And, and, but to go into the, the Green Beret, the, 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 the Marines Commando, was a, a stage I was not ready for it. I knew I would uh, not pass the test. So I jumped off the plane, I've done this, I've done all this, I've done a lot of things. Oh. But something inside me, so, I'd, you know, I wasn't built for, for that, you know, I was, too stall and too, well, I don't know, that's my excuse anyway. But okay. uh, um, So I left and I cried when I left, you know, because you, I, it was like a family. It was something I, I really bonded with and I loved it. Um, but I got no regret, you know, so it, I went to do some ski season uh, and that's where I learned to meet some English people. Um, so I started a bit of English, you know, going out and <laughs> it's crazy in England. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Uh, and then did some season in Brittany uh, during the summer and went back to the mountain to ski season and I met some English people and they invited me to come in England for two weeks and I stayed. Mm. And that ah, was 37 so you years stayed ago. here in England? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So because... And you speak no English then? Back then? I didn't speak, I mean, my English was nobody oh. could understand me. Still now. So, <laughs> so but you know, it's a, I guess when I was in France, in Brittany, it's a, such a small insular part of France. You are... A Breton live in Brittany, and your expectancy of life, if you got no qualification, is very small. So when I came in England, I realized I'm a new person. I'm I'm just a French millionaire. So people don't judge you by class. You're not upper class. You're not middle class. You're not working class. So you just be you. And French class. You're just <laughs> French, and you. So people assume you know about bread, you know about cooking, you know about everything, like yeah. maybe a little bit, you know, but you knew more than them. So um, How was the, the bread culture here in UK when you arrived? Terrible. Terrible. Mm. And the food was started to, to be better. Mm. And the transformation in, in, in UK the past 37 years is incredible. Mm. Incredible. I mean, you eat better in here than you do in France sometimes. You know, it's, it's, it's insane. But you mean it's, English food? Because... The, well, English food, English culture, the, even the English speciality from the old day has come back now and yes. it's done properly. So Because English bread, good English bread is fantastic. Mm. But we've, I think in Britain after the war, we lost our culture on cheese, mm. bread, cider, and everything. All the skill, it's coming back. understanding fermentation, understanding, taking time to do good things has come back now. Mm. And it's, it's it, the cheese in this country, the wine now, we understand. Uh, the wine. It's, it's, yeah. <laughs> well, that's French, this one, sorry. Cheese. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't do a podcast with that wine. It's impossible. Uh, and what kind of bread do they eat here? More white, uh, white bread? Or well, the culture of bread in this country was always white slice, crappy bread. You know, mm. like two slices of sponge and like yeah, to make a sandwich. And, yeah. So, but to make, I don't know what. You know, it's uh, it's terrible. So I, I guess when I first arrived in England, my my dream was always to relaunch a sliced bread loaf, but with mm. just three ingredients, not 14, 15 ingredients. Yeah, I'm pleased I've achieved that over over my life and you know, over the bakery. But I think bread in in this country was, you know, the sliced bread was convenient, so they buy bread once a week, you know, mm -hmm. and they make sandwich for the kids and stuff like that. When my culture and you know culture in Spain, Italy, all that, you buy bread every day. It's part of your life, yeah, you know. Maybe twice a day. Maybe twice a day, <laughs> yeah, or three times a day, you know. But uh, in here, it was you buy your bread on on Sunday for yeah. the rest of the week, uh, and the weekend you might treat yourself with a 
something a bit different. Yeah. You know? What year are we talking about? That's 1988 when I arrived in here. 98. 88. Okay. So it feels like a long time ago. Uh, it is a long time ago. Um, so I've seen the transformation, you know, and, and the restaurant used to have part baked bread, you know, crappy stuff. You know, they put some egg wash on top and bake it. It's like, oh God. <laughs> it was just. But the, the food culture started to change. The great chef, uh, Marco, uh, not Marco, it's too, too early, Nicolas Denis, uh, Raymond Blanc, Pierre Kaufman, there's a lot of chefs in London started to, to grow young chefs around them. And those young chefs became chefs themselves and grew other chefs, and it just cascaded all over the country. And so, recovered the, the old tradition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So all the pub culture in this country, when the pub stopped being pub serving drinks, so those chefs moved on by pubs, to become gastro pub. Okay. So food started to be a paramount instead of, of drink. So, the, you know, it's, it's start, the old culture started to change. We start, understand food and, you know, a good English breakfast is amazing. A good ro a Sunday roast is amazing, you know. So it's to go back to the basics, do them better and understand the welfare of animals, understand the, the welfare, how to grow things properly. So there's, the whole thing has changed so much in this country, you know, and there's some great product in England. And what was your work in that time? Did you were in a bakery? <laughs> when I first arrived in England, I went to a, a local supermarket called mm. Safeway, and there was, that's the only bakery I could see. Mm. And they were in-store bakery in the store. And I said, can I have a job, please? And the head baker, he was dressed like a cricket umpire, you know, white blues and straw hat with his hair like that. <laughs> and he looked at my CV, he said, no, you're not qualified enough. Oh, and <laughs> what? Said, Sorry, I look at the brand there. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> You're not qualified to make this <laughs> yeah, kind of. You use free mixes. Right. You, you don't even know what dough looks like, and it's just I'm not. <laughs> I was like, up yours, you know. And I said, so that's. Uh, I, I was just like, fine, and um, but that's that was the culture on those days. You know, it's uh, it's uh, the guy was just. I could, you could tell you couldn't make bread for toffee. You just, but they use premixes and stuff. So, oh, yeah. so I would never last there anyway. I would lose my temper. But then I went to work in a in a hotel restaurant, mm. uh, in a hotel where they wanted to open a bakery. But it took it took a long time for them to to open. So I work in a, at the front of house because I did front of house in Paris. You know, uh, so I work with the waiter. So I've learned a lot of things. Part of the the hospitality. So I work in in kitchen, uh, front of house. Baking came back a bit later in my life, so. The flowers that were in England at that time were with good quality, or? I see the flower, we didn't understand too much flat flower. Flower was more for the, inst the big bakeries, you know, there's, uh, the flowers evolved so much more since, you know, it's, uh, if you wanted to make French bread, you import French flour. Yeah, you had to you bring, to, yeah. yeah. Um, and on those days, but you know, um, so if you talk about flour, before flour, there's the farmer, Yeah. And the miller. So the farmer got better, the miller got better, and the flower got better. So it goes back right to the root of everything, the way we farm things, the way we understand the land, the weather, and the weather has changed so much in 40 years, you know. So it's a, it's a, it's a kind of... Um, um, everything makes changed. sense. Everything, hmm? every, everything cascades from somewhere all hmm. the time, you know. So everything gets better. But uh, the British flower, you know, I, I make some great bread with it. You know, it's, yep. I, I believe it's what you do with it. You can have a very poor flower and still make good bread with it. Mm -hmm. you've, but you've got to understand what you're working with. The technique is an important. Technique, I never see it. But the technique, you can have a machine, but if you don't understand dough, it's mm -hmm. very hard. But your hand will, t will tell you how the dough feels. And as you make your dough, you understand what that dough can, uh, what the dough can do or what you need to do with it, resting, whatever. You've got to understand that. And sometimes... No, we were talking about resting flour earlier on everything else. You know, the way you, I can, my whole baker taught me, you hold the flour, squeeze really hard as you open your hand, mm -hmm. have the flour break in your hand, you know the strength of the flour. Mm -hmm. And I thought, like, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. But it's true. You know, mm -hmm. you just, but, you know, if it's very fresh flour, it smells different, you know. Mm -hmm. It's something you just, it's something you, you can't write this in book. You can't just say, put your hand in flour, squeeze it, open, smell, mm -hmm. and then if it smells like this, it's fine. Because, It's something you do like with wine, you know. Some people drink cork wine. I smell it, it's disgusting, but they don't know what cork wine is, so they think that's the way you should test. No, it's not. So knowledge is something with experience all the time. It just it's not something which is your gut feeling, which is an ingredient for baking, is not written in books. 
Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. I, I, I teach people. I said, if he, if he's cold, you put jumper on, don't you? So yes. <laughs> well, the door's the same. Mm -hmm. You know, if he's really hot, you put your door in the fridge. You take the layer off. <laughs> oh yes, well, exactly. <laughs> but okay. we're just saying you follow recipes. You know, but recipes are. If you write a book in Buenos Aires, it's not the same with the idea. So you try to adapt to make something foolproof for everybody. And that's really hard. So back then you were already teaching. When did I you find out that you loved teaching? That's very interesting because I started mm. teaching in London mm. um, um, in a school called Divertimenti. So I started doing some class, French bistro cooking, a bit of cooking and baking also. Mm -hmm. I remember my first bread class I did there. And there are 12 stations. Oh. Everybody were by themselves. Everybody, everybody was miserable. Nobody's talking. I was like... I can't teach that. So I became a teacher then. I remember very but clearly. You were not like a regular French teacher, which are no, really, no, 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 no. I, don't know but I want people to have fun and relax because if you mm. if you have fun and relax, you learn. Yeah, and you get good memories. And if you're scared yeah. for four hours, yeah. you're never going to absorb anything. Mm -hmm. So after an hour of people being petrified and not talking, I mm. said, "I've had enough now." So I went in the middle of the classroom. I said, "Okay, you four put your table together. You four put your table together. You four put your table together." They did that and started working together. That must first change in, within five minutes. They started the Bertinet method. <laughs> well, sort of. I mean, what is the Bertinet method? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you have to come in here and discover it. It's not, it's, the Bertinet method is, is not, it's, it's a combination of everything. Okay, yeah. there's the technique I use, which is different. You know, people say it's Bertinet. Yeah, what I've done is readapting a very old technique yeah. to home baking. Okay. And when you look at many books, you know, they, They will say they have plenty of recipe, but the mixing part is like two lines, you know. Knead vigorously for 20 yeah. minutes until light, so and elastic. What does that mean? Yeah. And they got a picture of the flour there and knead the dough, and, and the picture of the bread is not the dough. I can tell you that now. Este programa es presentado por Molinos Como, que son los que uso para hacer la harina con la que hago mis panes. Podemos moler todo tipo de cereales como trigo, centeno, camut, espelta y tantos más. Con estos molinos vas a poder hacer la mejor harina artesanal casera, de forma totalmente artesanal y con todo el aporte que te dan los granos enteros, la fibra y los minerales. Además lo bueno es que podés graduar qué tan gruesa o tan fina querés la harina. Simplemente girás la tolva, elegís el punto y el molino se encarga de hacerlo por vos. Y tenés la harina más fresca, más saludable y más nutritiva que puedas hacer. Así que no lo dudes, accede acá en el enlace de la descripción y conseguite tu propio molino como. Y hace, como yo, la mejor harina casera y el pan más rico que puedas hacer en tu vida. What I've done is really when I first read my first English baking book, I couldn't understand how they made dough. It didn't make sense to me at all from what I've learned from early age. Um, because for me, everything starts with dough. Everything, if you get the dough right, you make good bread. You make crab dough, you make crab bread. It's very simple. It's, you know, it's your foundation is everything. So I look at what they were doing in here, and then kneading process and adding flour all the time. You change everything around. It's, why, what's the point to have a recipe when you change everything around? When the, how can you bake when you say to people, add a bit more water if you feel like it? Mm -hmm. You can't say that to people. You've got to be precise on your instruction. So I said, make bread again by hand, just to get the feel of the dough again. And um, the method I was using, I tried to understand where it came from. So I read a few books in French. And everything I was doing made sense then. So I started to put the jigsaw together and, um, and put all this together. So the idea of putting this onto a book, for me, started from there. And the more I was teaching people, the more I realized I had a message to come across, to, to give to people. But I don't wanted to write a book with 200 recipes because I don't have 200 recipes. I don't have that. And I don't have, you know, sourdough. It's like, how can you make sourdough when you don't understand the basic? Because I, To teaching people, I knew they wanted to do the hard thing before they understand the basic. Yeah. As a human being, you say, oh, I don't do the basic, I know better, especially when you grow up. So I said, how can I, how can I just make a book where we go back to the basic to understand the making of the dough, the basic? So I went to see about five publishers, and they all said, yeah, and bread was not a big, big thing at the time. There was mm -hmm. one or two bread books, you know, Dan Lepa was one of them, and um, there's one or two bread books, but nothing really very dramatic. Um, so I went to see a few publisher and they said, yeah, if you do a bread book, yes, yeah, we, we want it, but we need 200 recipe and you need to have sourdough in there. Sourdough is going to be fashionable. I said, fine, but that's in the second book, not on the first one. And I don't have 200 recipe. I give you five or six recipes and they couldn't understand the way I was doing it. 
So after five premiers, she would say, no. I said, I need to lie for the next one. <laughs> so <laughs> I went, went to the last one. I said, we need sourdough. Yes, of course you do. <laughs> <laughs> and we need 200 recipes. Of course you do. <laughs> yeah, they always want recipes. Uh, so I said, no problem. And then they let me do the book. I said, big mistake. <laughs> yeah. So I had a, a food writer with me, uh, Sheila Kitty, who's, who's been a good friend and wrote all my book with me as a ghost writer. Uh, ah. Because she, she listened to what I say. Every word in the book is my word, but she put yeah, yeah. my crazy language she into words. put that in the words. Yeah. And then <laughs> the same photographer. And we spent two weeks in my kitchen in London making bread, you know. But I said to them, I don't have to own a recipe. I got five. Out of five recipes, we're going to make a lot of different bread. Yeah. And we're going to write in big letters in the book, you know, mm. and a lot of pictures. Mm. I said, but the publisher's going to kill us. I say, I know, it's fine, don't <laughs> worry, I'll deal with them. <laughs> and, uh, and then, the, um, so we did all that. And then I said to, I said to them, because my, my, the technique I, I use is so complicated to understand. You can put as many words as you want. It's really hard to understand. Yes. And the way we learn is so very graphic. It's something very visual. Yeah. So I said, we need to find a way to, to get people closer to what I do. The only way on those days, in 2005, there was no Instagram, there was no social media, was to do make a DVD. Now, DVD, people don't even know Videos. what DVD is. So, yeah. you know, we made a DVD. We, put, mm -hmm. we, we pay for the DVD ourselves, uh -huh. not the publisher. I didn't tell the publisher, make a DVD, film it ourselves, and everything else, you know, and I had long hair then, I'm only joking. <laughs> yeah, but uh, it was very Rocker. cruel and very, very... But it gave you the... It took you a step further than any other book close to the door because you can read soft dough, sticky dough, but when you see it on the DVD, it's very sticky. So yeah. people just know it's, it's possible. Right, and images is much more than. So we went to see the publisher when the other thing finished. The publisher said, like, "But well, there's no turn recipe." I said, "No." No. <laughs> I said, "How many recipes there is?" I said, "Wow, well, five base recipe, about sixty recipe altogether." I said, well, where the sourdough? Nah. <laughs> I said, well, you said? I said, I know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's a dough, not sourdough. I said, dough. it's called dough. It's not, you know, I said, it's a foundation. You got to understand. I said, but he would never say it. I said, I know. But we've got this. So I gave her a DVD, and then we played it for her. I said, what are you going to do with this? I said, I want to put it in the book. I said, what do you mean, how? Mm -hmm. So we put a little thing, we stick it into the book. Yeah. So it's never been done before. I said, "Yeah, I know. Let's do it." <laughs> I said, well, we, "The price is eighteen ninety nine. I said, "Put nineteen ninety nine, so it's a bargain." Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I said, "Oh, that's a good idea." <laughs> Money all the time. Yeah, and we did, and we launched it, and um, that's a huge success. And it, a dog became. I mean, the, all the press in England, we had serialization of the book. You went being in America. When I look at the copy of the, of the bread in, in dough, I'm like, oh my God, it's horrible. Because you know, when you do something, it was coming out of the oven, nothing is perfect in the book. But it was, it was what we did on the day. I see this one picture we burnt. I said, I can't put this in the book, it's too bad. So, <laughs> uh, uh, but everything came out of the, we, we shoot it as it came out. We didn't redo it, we just keep it very, very homely. Yeah. Um, it became a bestseller, right? And this it, is the first still, edition, this is the first book. Yeah. Look how it is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, it still sell usually all over the world. I see we probably sold about 500,000 copies now, for, which for a bread book. Mm -hmm. And then in America, I didn't know anything about America. We won the James Beard, the Julia Child IACP award, Incredible. which for me I didn't know at the time. And my parish said, You won. I said, Won what? James Beard. I said, Okay, what does he mean? <laughs> now I, I wish I wasn't invited to go there, you know, mm -hmm. I wish. You know, because it's huge, you know, all this world. So, uh, how many editions uh, did this book uh, reach? It's been reprinted oh, reprint so many times now. Yeah. now. And many la different languages, too. Uh, 35 countries, about 17 mm. languages. Oof. So, and it's still set. And he translated every single language. I know, I mm. know. Oh, the Japanese was the hardest. <laughs> <laughs> Especially the DVD. <laughs> the DVD recording. Like <laughs> how do you say sour dog in Japanese, Richard? Sorry. How do you say sour dog started in Japanese? I can't hear you. The sound is really bad. <laughs> Este programa está presentado por Gluten Morgan TV, la plataforma de cursos on demand donde aprenderás a hacer panes y pizzas de masa madre, conservas, hamburguesas, panetones, pastas italianas y mucho más. Con un método de enseñanza muy fácil, aprenderás a hacer las recetas que siempre quisiste desde la comunidad de tu hogar y con los mejores chefs. Accede hoy mismo a glutenmorgantv.com y descubre todos los cursos que tenemos para vos.
So Richard, talking about um, sourdough, sourdough yep. starter, I, I've seen some videos of yours where you teach how to make sourdough and in an easy way. That's why I think we have in common more than this. <laughs> But it's an easy way because most of the people are afraid when they start with the sourdough. They, they just go with the recipe step by step. And I think that's maybe the problem. You make it really easy. <sighs> Would you start with sourdough? I mean, when sourdough, start, sourdough is, is another type of fermentation, you know? Mm -hmm. And sourdough has been made into kind of a holy grail of something, you know. It just make good, make a basic white dough first. Understand how dough works, and then sourdough will come easy. It's a different way of fermenting. You do it's a slow process. You make your own yeast. So if you yeah, simplify the process, it's homemade it's a yeast. Different yeast. Exactly. <laughs> so, but people, and the way I feel now, sometimes sourdough in, in England, you know, you need to have a beard, you need to have a tattoos yeah. everywhere, and a flat <laughs> yeah. cap, and flip flop, you know, to make it just become so hippie like, you know, and so. It's bread for Christ. Oh, you need to be know? some kind of druid or yeah, 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 yeah. Mm, like, something oh ma God. magic. And yeah, so at the end of the day, dough is dough, okay? The way you ferment your dough is a different process. So when I started my bakery, you know, I thought if I start making liquid ferment and refresh and leave it ambient and bubbling away or whatever, my bakers will never understand. I had to simplify the process. So I went back to a very old process using cold, uh, cold fermentation. Mm -hmm. So my ferment live in the fridge all the time. I use it straight from the fridge to make my bread. So I made a, yeah, it's like I make a, my, 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 start, my ferment started 27 years ago in London. And um, it was just a mixture of a tiny bit of honey, some spelled flour, white flour, water, leave it ferment, refresh it two or three times, and build it up to a, a bigger volume. So I kept more ferment than normal, but it lived in the fridge. So I could use it for two or three days without refreshing it. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought, You know, I kept it going for all those years and I refreshed it when I wanted to. It was no pressure to refresh it. So when I started the bakery, I thought, how can I simplify the process of my bakers? How can I make my process to make 10 thousand loaf, 100 thousand loaf a day by simplifying the process? And the only way I could think of is to use my, my ferment to multiply it and to use cold ferment, you know, so refresh it, leave it two days in the fridge to ferment and use it straight from the fridge. Mm -hmm. So it, the bakery, uh, when I, before I sold it, we used probably a ton of ferment a night. It's one job a, a day for one guy to refresh the ferment and every, everything time, so everything was pushed into the thing, we use it straight away. So 10 kilo, 10 kilo of ferment, it's easy to use. Mm -hmm. and, you know, 10 ladle of some yeah. messy stuff goes everywhere. You know, for, for, so for the type of bread I was making I wanted to achieve, it was the best way of doing it. You know, I got nothing against... You know, you make your dough, make a, a, a dough out of this, and that dough will ferment the next one, and so on and so on. The practical way of making bread in a bakery, I don't think that's the right way. I think it's very confusing for your bakers, and you need a lot of knowledge to understand that. You know, the bakery I know who make bread on a, on a big scale, um, like that, they, they will make their sourdough dough, and then they take, so if you make 80 kilo of dough, you use 60 kilo, that 20 kilo, you leave it there, that 20 kilo will ferment the next one. Mm -hmm. You keep doing this process mm -hmm. all the time. Okay, the mother ferment stays somewhere, but that's the easiest way of making bread. And your it's ferment is, is, is stiffer, it's, just, it's not so that liquid. So I it's stiff, yeah. Stiff, it's yeah. easier to So manipulate. in winter or summer, it's always the same. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, and that for me, that was the key for a baker to understand. Something cold, straight from the cold, straight from the fridge, and then you bake it. And all our, all our sourdough, they prove very slowly in the fridge or mm -hmm. you know, a 10 degree maximum, and straight from the fridge, they go straight in the oven. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's no... No mistaking, it's always the same temperature, mm -hmm. winter and summer. And what about the, the acid? Is it not too acid? The, the, mm -hmm. Again, it's about timing. It's about yeah. the timing of your dough. You, know, you, you make your dough, you let it um, ferment or rest for you know, five, six hours. You know, so in summer, it'll be a bit less, in winter, a bit more. Mm. You know, Because French people, they left more acid bread than maybe than here in, in England. I think my ferment, My sourdough is got a kind of the right balance between sweetness and sourdough. Mm. The thing again with the word sourdough, we yeah. think it's going to be sour. Mm. And you, you know, the, the internet is full of people craving for the massive big hole and look how big my hole is. Oh, bloody hell, stop, you know. <laughs> Just, you know, and so acidic or whatever. Most people don't like it. Too. Kids, give them sourdough, children are like, uh, yeah. it's too acid. <laughs> and you put butter on the big hole, it yeah. goes in your hand, you know. So, It's olive oil. Be, yeah, olive oil. It's got to be the right medium. Okay, so you, know, you can make very tight bread, like German bread, Vulcan mm -hmm. bread, and stuff like that. Very yeah. acidic if you want to, but it's beautiful. You know, yeah. so it's, it's, um, there's, uh, there's too many 
experts now mm -hmm. out there who try to teach other people and don't understand themselves what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So, um, which is great for the bread, the bread in general, but I think makes things simple to start with. Start with the basic, understand the basic, have fun making bread at home, find mm -hmm. your little corner in your kitchen when you're happy to be there and, and stop competing with people who are making bread for 25 years. You know? Yeah. Go slowly, make bread that you're happy with your family. Make and good bread. Make good bread, you know. It's, <laughs> you know, it's, bread is so simple, but we make it complicated. I think that Ramon with Glute Morgan did something like this for the Spanish audience yeah. because he communicated something that the people thought that was uh, complicated in an in a easy way. For example, for doing a sourdough starter, you, you didn't uh, weigh the ingredients, right? See, more, more just to, to, like you said, read the dough, common sense, not not just going step by step, like they say, like the recipe, it's easier. Yeah, it's, I think good teachers got different way of communicating. So it's, everybody will find um, their teacher, you know, and the style I use, a lot of people like it. You know, the style you use, a lot of people like it. You know, and you find your own pathway somewhere with the right mm -hmm. people. So it's mm -hmm. a... It's finding the technique you're happy with. But if you keep changing everything you do every day, you yeah. have no foundation. Yeah. And people are always very easy to blame everything else rather than blame themselves. Ah, yeah. Uh, they will blame the flour, they blame the oven, they blame yeah. this, the they blame the recipe, they blame the top <laughs> they blame everything. It's like, <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah. Well, it should be this, it should be that. No, it shouldn't be. You know, mm. you can't write five tablespoons of common sense <laughs> in a recipe. You know, common sense you ask you people get, oh, they don't sometimes, you know. Mm. So it's a uh, It's, um, you know, you, you prove you're doing 18 degrees for 18 hours. 18 hours at 26 degrees is not the same. But people say, you say 18 hours. Yeah, I say 18 degrees. What's the temperature mm -hmm. in the kitchen? Yeah. 26. Well, it's not going to be the same, is it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's... So we assume bread is easy. It's not. But it's... Um, You see, that's why I love teaching because you try to demystify things. You try to make things, things simple. You try to make mm -hmm. people have no excuse they can't make bread. Mm -hmm. You take all the excuse. I don't have kitchen with wooden. Doesn't matter. You can do it on marble or mm -hmm. I don't have this. I don't have it either. I oh, don't yeah. have this. I don't have it either. So where's mm -hmm. your excuse? And yeah. speaking about sourdough bread, uh, what do you find more important, the texture or the taste? Or both. I think, or both. I think hmm. both. Yeah, you know, if your texture is wrong, then your taste won't be right. Yeah, you know, it's uh, for the type of bread you're making. So it's going to be the right balance between the two of them. It's a 50-50. I think so, but uh, mm. for me, it's going to look good first. If you yeah. look good, then everything will follow. Yeah. But if you look like a brick, it will taste like a brick. Mm. So if you look like a car crash, then it will taste like a car crash. So it's it's going to be mm. the right balance of everything. So I think for me, if some things look good. He satisfy part of, of my brain, mm -hmm. and then when I cut into it, I can see the texture, and I'll be very happy. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a real combination of everything. Like okay. I, when we talk about baguette, you, know, you open the door, you see they all burst. I know it'll be good. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, if I open the door and they, the, they haven't burst and they all look crap, I don't even want to test them because mm -hmm. I know it's not what I'm. The, the, way, the way they look is not going to satisfy what I want. Mm -hmm. okay. So it's uh, you know bread. Bread and dough is like a language. You you can see the crust. You can see everything. He talk to you. You know, it's, it's, it, unless you make bread all the time, people don't understand. So sometimes we make baguette and I show people a bad cut and they look crap. And I show a beautiful baguette with a beautiful line on top. I say, which one would you buy in a shop? And they say, well, I don't know. I said, well, you've got no sense of bread. <laughs> But when people say, oh, yeah, this is beautiful. I say, exactly. Imagine all those baguettes with a nice big cut. Mm -hmm. They look beautiful. Imagine all those baguettes with the shit crud that I didn't say shit, sorry. <laughs> all the crap cut there. You don't buy it, do it. It's a, if you don't understand bread, you don't understand that. But when you teach people, you want that people to buy into this. You want people to buy into that the same vision as what you've got. Okay. If they get it, then they understand. An yeah. irregular crumb is an indication of a good bread? Yeah, I see re regularity is everything, but baguette will dictate everything. So if you make good dough, you make good baguette. If you divide properly, you shape properly, mm -hmm. and you prove and you bake properly, then the crumb and the crust will be together. You never get a good burst on top and, and, and crap crumb inside. The mm -hmm. two's got to go together. Mm -hmm. Because he, to make the baguette with the shaping, it really push you to the limit to understand that bread making. You can do everything right, and don't put enough steam, or you know, and then you don't get the burst. Uh, so there's so many elements in bread making that's 
uh, push you hard, you know. Mm-hmm. And talking about baguettes, what do you think about the British baguettes? Now, you said that you can get decent English baguette here, right There's now? There's bakery who make good baguettes, you know, it's, um, it depends what you're looking for. I mean, the, even in France now, some of, the, some of the bread has gone really, really bad, you know. We want mm-hmm. cheap food in France and, you know, they're made in massive scale and they're very white inside and very mm-hmm. thin crust and no, no, no soul into it, you know. Yeah. So, um, um, you know, the baguette I make, I make with English flour, you make good baguettes. Yeah. So it's but you're like, French, still a little bit. There's a bit of a ha <laughs> 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 But um, it depends what you call baguettes, you know. It's, well, um, you know, the, the French stick, as we call it in Yeah, French yeah. stick. It's, like, it's like so long, tense and long, French. long and crap cut on top. It tastes like yeah. cotton wool and it's like, people oh. say, oh, it's a baguette. No, it's not no. a baguette, thank you. It's, uh, you know, it's different. But, you know, it's, The thing with bread, what's happened, I think, in England, we become very snobbish about bread. You know, we we say, don't eat bad bread. But the problem is, everything costs so much money now, you mm. can't tell people, do this or don't do that. I mm. think you can educate people. You can tell them, if you eat this, there's this much in there, and slowly change their mind. It takes time, you know. It, it takes a long time. You can't tell people, don't do this and don't do that. And bread with yeast is bad. Yeah. Bollocks. That's really drives me mad when people yeah. say that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You can grate bread with yeast in there. Mm, of course. Know? It's mm-hmm. it's mm. it's ludicrous that we should just yeah. eat sourdough. I mean, that's why I hate about yeah. that. But you can you, you eat horrible sourdough bread too. A lot well, that's of... the thing. It's like when organic came out. Yeah. You know, people, it's, it's organic. It's very expensive. Yeah, but it's organic. But it's yeah. shit. Yeah, it's <laughs> like, <laughs> but it's organic. I said, well, it's organic shit then, you know. Oh, also, <laughs> when they say homemade bread, it's not always mm. home. Yes, it's homemade, but it's... Horrible. Yeah, but Sorry. homemade doesn't make it better, does it? Yeah. If That's you eat a brick, homemade. Oh, yeah, exactly. it's a Then homemade it's like brick art. bread. And can you reach an artisanal bread doing it by industrial uh, methods? Yes, I've it, done it. You've done it. How was that experience for you? It was ex- interesting because technology can be used for the right thing. Yeah. Okay. Dividing 10 tons of loaf by hand yeah. is ludicrous. When there's machine, you can divide the dough very slowly, respect your dough and everything else. Mm-hmm. So it's part of the pro- you know, People say, oh, bread made by hand is better. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, you go to the bakery and mix, mix uh, five tons of dough tonight by hand. Yeah. Of course you don't. So you've got to use the right piece of kit for the right thing. You can yeah. use provers, fridge, and everything else. So it's, I think it's a combination of, there's two things in, in, in big scale bakery. You use people, and that costs money and training, or you use machinery and you press button, and you make a lot of money, but yeah. there's very little skill. So, uh, but when you make proper bread, that doesn't work. If you make high-speed bread in two hours, a lot of chemical to make it behave, mm-hmm. then it's a different way of baking. But for our sourdough, the sliced bread we launch, then you have to respect a few processes. Um, so the mixing machine, of course. Yeah. I think that the key is to respect the, the, the processes. If you respect this process and you know about the processes, it's not just thinking about money. You maybe you know this process will take eight hours to, to be finished, then it's okay not, not to make it in two, four. And, yeah. and that. But the thing is, is, that process, for me to understand, is fine. <laughs> to pass on the knowledge to bakers who understand that process yeah. and see. What does it take 10 hours when I could do that in two hours? <laughs> no, that's no, it. exactly. Then comes a problem. So you got to keep mm. those two sheep going together and not that one sheep going this way. Yeah. Because six months later, it's down there. And to get yeah. it back in, that's take one year. And yeah. your quality goes down there. Okay. Yeah. So it's, you, you become a manager, you become a, 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 a fighter to fight every corner and make sure they keep the sheep together all mm-hmm. the time in the line. And that's a hard job, you know, mm-hmm. because people say, well, what does he do that? Yeah. Why do I put flour? I say put spray oil, you know, spray chemical yeah. to make it non-stick. I said, well, there's a reason. There's mm-hmm. chemical in there. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, but it's easier. I said, I know, but I don't want this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, if you say you can put a bit of oil, it's easier. A bit of oil for me is like funny, fine, very fine. For them, it's like half a liter of oil yeah. mm-hmm. because it's easier to process. Mm-hmm. So it's all the thing you have to see for them. You know, it's. Uh, uh, But you got to spend time to explain to them why you're doing things. Yeah. That's the hardest part when you're multiplying mm-hmm. on a bigger scale. The result of the bread done with industrial process is the same as the artisanal well, one? I would call it industrial process. I, I call it artisan process but on a bigger scale. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. When you call industry or is what industry or is when you just have machinery to do everything. You know, so it's a it's a semi industrial I would say. You know, mm -hmm. you use the right piece of kit for the right part of the job. Mm -hmm. Now we use sliced bread. Now imagine a knife with a bread with a bread knife to cut every ten thousand loaf. You mm -hmm. wouldn't do that. You yeah. use slices. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's you got to use the right piece of kit for the right thing. You know, okay. you need to have a chef life on the sliced loaf. To, to, to be able to go on the supermarket. And this bread of yours is uh, being offered in supermarkets, for example? Yeah, okay. it's, and it's in uh, Waitrose and Sainsbury, but I've sold it, so it's nothing to do with me. Mm. But I'm still proud to see the Bertina Bakery name. How, how, was, how was uh, that? Uh, you licensed your brand? How? It's not last, I sold the bakery and mm -hmm. I sold the, the brand name. The brand name, So yeah. in, bakery, in the bakery where making a lot of bread is one thing, to make money out of it is very hard. No. But if you've got a good brand that is well established, that people recognize, that's what its value is. You know? mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's, um, it's where to make a choice. You, know, you can't have it both ways. Uh, so uh, running a bakery with 200 staff and then running a cooking school, which I love doing. And being a YouTuber, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, different with YouTube there. <laughs> we'll talk about this one later. Uh, <laughs> Um, but you know it's uh, and uh, having a family life and everything it's, it's going to be really hard you know uh, sometimes I was teaching all day in here run, drive to London to the bakery yeah. in London spend all night there with the boys you know spend all day with them drive back teach the next day and you just become like what's happened yeah. you go to the bakery you say okay you do this do that yeah okay you come back the next morning and they've done this you're like yeah. which, which part of this did you get <laughs> Are you sure of that? I said, no, I didn't show you that. I showed you this. No, you didn't. No. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, no. I can't imagine that. Mm. No, honestly, he's like, you're talking to a brick, you get more response sometimes, you know? It's uh, mm. So if, I see what, what's happened with you, a good question you asked earlier, but to multiply on big scale, I think your expectations go too lower. If you expect 100% every night, you will die. You cannot achieve 100% every night. You've got to lower your expectation mm -hmm. because people are not the same. You employ people who just do a job, not they're not you. So you got to, I lower my expectations 95%. Mm. Give myself 2% each way and say, okay, that's fine. You know, mm -hmm. If they can do that every night for the next 10 years, then we'd be fine. When did you recognize your limitations? <laughs> the day I opened the bakery in here. <laughs> <laughs> because the you can't be everywhere. I know mm -hmm. what I want. I know my stuff. I know, and when it's yours, you see things in different ways. Uh, and people here in England, and may, I don't know in France, but here, do they like more buying the uh, nice sliced bread or maybe slicing it at home? Because not many people have um, a, a, a bread knife. That's, a, that's the other thing with sourdough. Mm. You look at many books and many uh, sourdough on Instagram, or whatever, the crust is so dark, you know, it's so thick, whatever. People at home don't have a good bread knife. Yeah. They don't know what the bread knife is. You know, they... Oh, yeah, 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 no. They got a big door set there, and then the <laughs> door is so, is so... They can't even chew on it. Yeah. You know, oh, I bought sourdough. Yeah, lovely. You can't eat it. <laughs> What's the point of it? So, for me, it was always to find the right way between the French way and also the, mm -hmm. the, the British way. So, it's convenience. You know, it doesn't matter which country you're from, you need to yeah. have the convenience. So, the sliced bread, you know, sourdough sliced bread was... You know, the crust is not the same as... So you bake on the sole of the oven, but yeah. you, you still have a crust and flavor mm -hmm. uh, and long process. And then after that, it was to make you know, bread that the English market would love. You know, we love focaccia in here. Mm. Wherever in England, in 1990, people would, couldn't even, even say the word ciabatta. Ciabatta. <laughs> focaccia in English, they, oh, they were too scared to say, fuck, fuck, focaccia. Caccia, only caccia. Caccia. What? Fuck. What? That's so funny. You go, you go to a meeting with the supermarket and say, we want some furniture. Focaccia. The what? The, you know the Italian bread will start with F. Ah, focaccia. <gasps> no! <laughs> Incredible. And ciabatta. Ciabatta. Oh, God. You know, it's, it was incredible. But, I know, never realized that. <clears throat> oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, focaccia. You know, so they heard of a word and then oh, <laughs> you go to a meeting and you got this young spotty buyers who just you don't slap them but you know it's, uh, it's changed so much you know it's, it's great but, yeah, yeah. Know, that's what I mean yeah, sourdough is great baguette is good but you know make bread that feed your family your family is happy then fantastic have you seen any bakery product that has been <coughs> gaining notoriety in the market the last years 
<laughs> oh, fashion, Christ. Um, I mean, the problem was, oh, I think you see the Cronuts. Cronuts? Ah, Cronuts. Yeah, Cronuts. Cronuts is funny because it's, it's huge and well done to uh, Anzo. He's done amazing, amazing things. Yeah. But I remember when, when I was a kid in the bakery at 14, we used to make croissants every day. And my boss used to keep all the trimming, you know, and we used to put them in the fridge. Uh. And on Saturday and Sunday, when it was really busy in a shop, long queue, when people were waiting, we used to get all the trimming and fry them. Ah. Uh-huh. Of the croissant and roll them in uh, sugar or icing sugar, or sugar with um, cinnamon, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then send one of us young young commie <laughs> and success. give it to people, you know, ah. having a little bit where they were waiting. So that was our cronuts at the time. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so we made cronuts a long time ago. Yeah. But we never clever enough to create cronuts. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, but it's. Uh, I think we like everything. We we crave for the new ingredients. You know, it's. Uh, the, I mean, the best one at the moment. Um, it's uh, Himalayan pink salt. What do you think yeah. about the panettone wave that's coming all around uh, it's, uh, the world? It's, uh, I think it's, if you can make panettone properly, it's fantastic. Mm-hmm. It's a great, great, long life and everything. But again, to master that, you know, I, mm. I can make panettone, but I can't make it as good as some people do. You mm. just you see them, they do, and everything. It's a real art to understand, you know, mm-hmm. to make it. So it's a, it's it's a great thing, you know. It's a, I always believe I stick to what I know best, you know. If I want to. I can make panettone. There's a recipe of panettone in my book. But, mm-hmm. You know, it's not. It's good, but it's not half as good as what those yeah. people. But again, those guys use uh, equipment and everything. And that's you know, it's designed for it. So it's it's a great thing. But um, panettone goes back a long time. So mm-hmm. it's it's like all recipe put back into fashion. You know, it's mm-hmm. uh, it's. Um, but since it's got a lot of, a lot of butter and you're French, <laughs> but you have brioche. <laughs> what is wrong with butter? <laughs> What's this? Yeah, but brioche, brioche is a type of panettone. Yeah, it's... You, know, you um, can make rum mm. baba, which is a very light stuff, which is made yeah. with, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, it's... Uh, it's Italian brioche in... Sort of, you sort know, of. but it's, uh, it's, it's bread that they, they understood that to make them to last for a long time, mm-hmm. you know, so... Uh, it's fashion, Kunaman would become mm. a fashion, you know, and mm. people make Kunaman ah, yeah, with croissant man. dough. Like, yeah. So, oh, it's lamination, lamination, cameras, yeah, lovely, but Kunaman was made with bread dough. Yeah. Not with croissant dough, yeah. you know. So everything is bastardized to make it easy. You know, it's uh, yeah. it's um, so when I do something, you know, I make it in, in, in the baker's way, not the pâtissier. You know, it's just a, a bit different. But it's um, um, I love flavor, you know. And yeah, look is great sometimes, you know. But flavor is uh, it's quite important also. And mm. about a croissant, what does a croissant, a perfect mm. croissant, has to look like and taste like? Yeah. <laughs> well. When I was a kid and apprentice, you know, we, the, ba- the boulanger and the pâtissier were two ah. different breeds, you know, yeah. two different qualifications. So the boulanger croissant is full of flavor, a bit rustic, you know. The pâtissier takes five days to make croissant, <laughs> you know. So it's a different way of doing it. So the croissant artichier, <laughs> we have one day to do it. It's a bastardized version between the two of them, you know. Mm. Making croissant at home, you know. One, people don't know how to use a rolling pin. Mm. They squash the sheet out of it. And two, proving croissant, you know, mm. proving dough and, and butter on the, on the same time yeah. is quite a skill. So we teach them yes. to do it in here, ambient. Mm-hmm. There's a way of doing things. But, you know, it's a um, um, lot of croissant. You see the picture of the river. They make it with a special butter, you know, the special yeah. flat butter. Yes. Which doesn't melt, so it puffs up very easily. Yeah. People do it at home with shitty butter and yeah. it goes everywhere. Yeah. You know? yes. So you got to, write, to find the right butter that you can buy in the supermarket to make croissant. So we teach them in this area, you know. Um, it's very easy to use professional equipment mm-hmm. and professional ingredients who's mm-hmm. going to look good all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But when you do it at home, you don't have mm-hmm. it and yeah. you blame yourself. So mm-hmm. I think sometimes you see books, you, you can tell the, the lamination has been done with a machine. You can tell the butter they use is mm. pâtissier butter which just will puff up on everything. But a good croissant should be airy and full of this huge pockets that well, you see big. now. That not was the original uh, I mean, croissant. There's, there's, Again, the, the croissant, if you look at the origin of the croissant, yeah, when the it started, it started in Vienna, you know, when mm. uh, it was a speciality, when, uh, when the Turkish army... Ah, yeah, the invade, bakers, you know, yeah. And the bakers were celebrated mm-hmm. by creating a new, yeah. a new unriched dough, you know. And they evolved into a laminated dough because the Viennese baker was very mm-hmm. good at it. And it became to the croissant we, we got there, you know. But uh, I think a croissant is a combination of, of good look, okay. Mm-hmm. But you go to French bakery... Every croissant will be different. Some are very puffy and full of butter. Mm-hmm. Some have got a good lamination mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. absolutely no soul. Mm-hmm. You know? 
And so a lot of people will try to make the good-looking croissant, but absolutely tastes of nothing. Mm. I, I'm trying to get people to do a bit above between. In Argentina, we have a, a native uh, version of croissant called Media Luna. Media Luna, I don't know if you have... Luna is moon, so... Yes, half moon. Half moon, half moon so like croissant, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it comes from from the croissant. The yeah. French, the first French bakers that went to Buenos Aires or Argentina started making croissant, but then with the lack of, of ingredients such as butter or maybe the flour, they started changing the recipe yeah. to into media lunas and they started using a fat instead of butter and all different kind of flowers and then became this new which now it has its own identity which is a media luna it's yeah. no longer it comes from the croissant but it's now like media luna because it's a little bit more uh, I don't know how to say Crystal it. The moon, yeah, yeah. Half but moon. you know the, the original croissant was just an unrich dough it was mm. a dough a dough, um, it wasn't rich. Uh, it was not laminated at all. It was mm. just a, a, a bread dough, but because ah. it was a celebration, they put butter and eggs in there to make it richer. And then uh-huh. it was probably rolled a little bit and curved into a crescent under the moon and was celebrated. And then, like everything, everything evolved. Everything yeah, become, yeah. You, know, you want to be lighter and lighter. So things moved on. Now you've got a croissant with 25 different colors and mm. super lamination, everything. Yeah. Which is great, you know. It's, it's lovely to see that, but I, I would never go that. You know, I would never specialize on that. It's mm-hmm. uh, it's uh, it's it's a different different thing. But you know, it's uh, it's amazing that our industry, our bakery industry, can evolve all the time, making new things all the time, and people mm-hmm. get a kick out of it. It's great, you know. Mm-hmm. For me, I like I don't change. I'm I, I quite I'm quite simple the way mm-hmm. I do things. I get a lot of joy at the baguette coming out of the oven, <laughs> being good, you know, mm-hmm. and sitting down with a bit of cheese and, and wine. I'm very happy with that. Yeah. Are you working yes. in a new Bertinet method, version two? <laughs> <laughs> version three? No. Yeah, people ask me, oh, make another book. Like, I don't have any more recipe. You know, it's, I don't like to write a book to create recipe to go into a book. Yeah. But, you know, so everything, I've, every recipe I got in my books is something, means something to me. Mm-hmm. So the only book I would love to do is a, a traveling book. To go to all ah. the country of my book is is, uh, is published mm. and learn from the two or three bakery from this country. That's a good that opportunity totally to visit us in Buenos Aires. That would be. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, just go around the country just to see the what the bakery industry does about, you know, and do a bit of a history, two or three pages about the bakery industry on this, in this country and the top recipe of, 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 of the country and, and try to read that, 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 that recipe into a... Um, Home, home, home baker stuff. Mm-hmm. So you are thinking about doing a book about that? Uh, I'd love to, you know. If anybody listen, I need a sponsor, <laughs> please, thank you. Well, wait, wait, yeah, we, 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 we may, we may uh, you, you may do, for example, like a TV show, but not for the TV, mm-hmm. but for the platforms. So yeah, you, make the show, yeah. you make the show, and also you have the book version. Yeah, I, I think it's, uh, I think now nowadays, if you got a, a visual element of it, so if it's, you know, if you got a, a TV series, which is, is on, on, on terrestrial TV or, or on, on, on the internet or something like that, and a book to go with it, then it's great. But, you know, it's uh, traveling now and go around countries costs a lot of money. So, mm-hmm. you know, to do 17 or 35 countries is impossible. But to do, you know, 10 countries, you can choose and do um, three, four recipes out of each one or something like that. It's, it's possible. Um, I like the idea. Or, or, you meet, as, as, meet, or you meet these bakers half of the way. <laughs> we meet, I know you're from Egypt, but maybe we can meet each other no, in Italy. I see, I see you, you <laughs> for the book to be real, you need to have the feel of the place. I mm. went to Marrakesh, I went to those bakery in you know, Atlas yeah. Mountain, find soul, soul plane at 2,000 meters, you know. Well, I want to capture in a book and a TV series what it means for those people, what bread means to those people. Mm. So the importance of bread, they don't waste anything, you know. And mm-hmm. if you go to all those countries, you can have a feel of, of, of what it is to feed people with a bit of flour. I like the idea. I think that mm. there may be an audience for that. So we may pitch this to a platform like mm-hmm. Netflix, Amazon. Uh, what do there's, you think? You know, Here, see the think, comments. We're, we're reading your comments. Yeah. I think, I think there's a huge, huge thing for people to learn about um, the culture of the country. So it's a bit of a history on the same time, but through bread, you know, what do you mean to country? Because bread links everything. Mm-hmm. There's, there's no other food who link everything from, yeah. from the Bible to any country. You know, bread is always uh, is so it's got so much power, powerful, powerful. Seed. You know, if you got flour, you you, you got food. You know, flour yeah. and water, you survive all the time. And so. the interesting is that with just plain flour and a little bit of water, you can make something in 3D. That's what I say. It was just a 
Nothing. Yeah, I always say you give one kilo of flour, any flour, and sure. some water to a baker. Yeah. Each one of them will come with different bread. Yeah, <laughs> it's the only food you can do that. So yeah. you know, if you master the fermentation and understand uh, what, and give them a bit of time, it's crazy. So it's a uh, you know, but to, to to go to a country like Ethiopia where you know the the, the grain the grain is grated and it, uh, or crushed and they put some water with it and they make beautiful bread with it. I mean, the skill on that. You know? mm-hmm. Like I said, in Marrakesh, I went there. You know, with this woman who's got nothing up there, and they make the beautiful bread, you know, baked on this tiny bit of, of fire underneath. And you just think, how do you do this? Mm. I tried with them, I just make a fool of myself. You know, just <laughs> like, the skill is, you, you see them, oh, it's easy. I tried, my bread is like everywhere, you know? <laughs> like I did in the, the birth in it method. It, 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 <laughs> there is another product that you like a lot. Uh, you may do a book about it, which is American cupcakes, right? Ah, I've read an article that you love cupcakes. <laughs> no. Okay. Do you want some more wine or not? <laughs> <laughs> so, what did you say? No, you? nothing. What? Uh, next question. What happens with American cupcakes, Richard? I love them. <laughs> I love them. <laughs> next question. Put more sugar on top. More sugar, yeah. Okay, so, for example, talking about baking machinery... Uh, have you seen the arm uh, mixer, which yeah, is very course. common in Spain? When uh, I know the, the Spanish we, we, Artofex, Artofex mixer, the mm-hmm. twin arm mixer, they're the only mixer who recreates the well, my method, something like that. You, know, you never see a mixer doing this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But Artofex make the best do by mm-hmm. 100 miles. You know, mm-hmm. or the, the twin arm. You know, the, the French Petrin with the, the oblique um, arms, which just means they do like that. You, know, you can hear the air going to it, you know. But dough is simple, you know, and machine was always created after your hands. Mm-hmm. So if you look at any mixer, even a spiral or whatever, stretch and get the air into it. You know, that's why I don't understand the kneading technique to make. Yeah, kneading is one way of doing it for tighter dough. But still, there's still a top and bottom on the dough, like I showed you, you know. So you got to understand how the dough works. If you rip the dough to bits and add more flour, you're going to change everything. So mm-hmm. that doesn't make sense to me. Uh, and then talking about the Bertinet School, you have uh, so many courses here. How do you pick uh, the course that you want and the recipes that you want to teach? I think when you start the school you know, all those years ago to where we are now, the five-day break class haven't changed much out of it. Mm. Uh, but what I've done is got better at teaching it. Mm. Now the French bread class we used to have five different doughs people got lost it was yeah. too many mm-hmm. so we do two or three doughs now and with that dough we do different things and it's about pushing people in different ways so every day on the five day I push them in different ways I teach them to manage themselves I teach them to work as a team so they, the more they say things out loud the more they learned it if you keep yourself to yourself you don't learn anything you got to be able to express what you've seen if you say what you've seen me doing and if you say it out loud you've learned it so it's a kind of different way of teaching um, um, when I teach pastry I go back to the basic so we make pastry again if you leave it to people if the dough see that more flour they change everything mm. so there's a method of making pastry and when they master the three bases they're like it's so simple I said yes if you get taught the right way it is simple mm-hmm. but you know it's people always think they know better Mm-hmm. The, the reflex, if you stick, they put flour. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they don't realize how much flour they add. It will change the recipe. Of course. Yeah. Because he says in many books, if you stick, add a bit more flour. No. Yeah. Flour your hand. Huge mistake. <laughs> no. You can't say it to people. Yeah. You know, if it's too, too, too wet, put a bit more flour. Yeah. Five because that's the, the first air. thing that you want to do when you get your hands all sticky. You yeah. add flour, but then you... We are not conditioned to have sticky hands. Mm. And we focus on our hand being sticky instead of mm-hmm. focus on the dough. Mm. Yes. And the doors they're laughing at you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and what about, for example, you did a series of courses with BBC Maestro, right? Yeah. Does these courses that you made, which were on demand, compete with the Vertinet Kitchen, which is live and in presence? I thought it would, but actually, a lot of people coming here yeah. who've been on BBC Maestro or got it and actually want to come still in here. It's the upsetting, yeah. right? It's a kind of. Uh, I see the BBC Maestro, you buy it, and you got six and a half hours of tuition. And what I've done on this one is based on recipes. And, um, and then it's, it's, it's very well filmed, it's very well done. Uh, and you learn a hell of a lot on this one, from, from basic white dough to sourdough onto this mm-hmm. one, uh, plus your know, burger buns, pizza, and the rest of it. So it's, uh, it's, um, 
we spend a lot of time doing it properly. Uh, but when you buy it, you can always go back to it. So it's your own personal course, you know. Uh, so it's a, you, you can teach. Uh, or when I first started the school, uh, you know, I hated when people were taking pictures and videos and stuff like that. I thought they're going to steal my stuff. Mm. But you don't. No. A skill is something. You know, you can co- try to copy it. Yeah. Try to say I'm, I'm doing it right or whatever. I can see by the body language. I can see by the door. Yeah. People copy it, but they don't understand it. Mm-hmm. The recipe is just a recipe. A recipe is a recipe. Words. Yeah. People can copy it. Mm-hmm. Copy my and technique. You can try to copy yeah. it. And but to actually understand wh- why you're doing mm-hmm. what you're doing, every movement's got a purpose. That's what people don't understand. Mm. So I see people copy my technique and teach other people, and they don't understand themselves. So the doors fly everywhere. There's no top, no bottom. The door is like, oh, what are you doing? <laughs> and people also like to to be with you and to learn it direct from experience. you. I see the it's more ex- you give away, the, experience. the more people say, I really want to come in here and yeah. learn. Actually, and uh, that's a good. And we've seen it because your school it is really open to, to the to the public. They <laughs> oh, can see you can. through the windows, <laughs> so they come and they're gonna take a picture. And maybe you're in the middle of something. And okay, you know, bread is. Uh, It's a social event. So when people mm. knock on the door, if they, if they come all the way from Malaysia, like today, yeah. <laughs> let them in, have a picture. It costs nothing to do that, you know, yeah. but you make that day. So you make them uh, happy, yeah. Make them happy. And, mm. you know, that's what I love doing in here. So it's, uh, it's good for Yes, the same happens to us. We have our own uh, on-demand platform with courses yeah. uh, from Ramon, Gluten Morgan, and other chefs from Latin America and Spain. But they continue, the, the audience continue going to the workshops which are live. Uh, yeah, they live. We, we the, had the same fear the as connection. you. As, as they first. want that act, the connection, and that it's important, really important. And yeah, we, got, we had people who, who I had some people who came 15 years ago. So it mm. took me 15 and years to come back. back, but still come back. Yes, mm. I had so many students that I've been yeah. your course and second and three times. So yeah, 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 people come 25, 30 times mm. in here. And also, it's important the food that that you serve. <laughs> Hospitality is everything. There's, a, yeah. Amer- there's one American couple. It's a whole couple. experience. There's one American couple who mm. come, who's been here, who come here now for 15 years, and they come in July. Doesn't matter what class it is. I see they've done the bread class about 10 times. Mm. They they come for two weeks, and they always choose when to come. And they all sit at the back over there. They don't care what they're learning. Yeah. They've done the class many times. They come for lunch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they sit down there. At the beginning, I introduced everybody, everybody's talking, and, say, and they say, I know you two, you come for lunch. I say, yep, yeah. <laughs> waiting for the wine. Yeah. And they just enjoy, for them, it's the best restaurant in the world. Isn't it? It's like, so yeah, yeah, you, yeah. you get different kick. That happened with once, yeah. there it's was a guy bit. who said the same thing to me. Yeah. No, I'm here just for the, for the food. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, they, they love meeting new people. Yeah. You know, and, um, yeah. and they become friends with new people. And it's people, a f- it's, way to socialize. Absolutely. Mm. Because you come in here for one thing, you all yeah. love bread. Okay? Mm-hmm. You might be crap at making bread, but you all love bread. Yeah. And then when you work in a group of four, mm-hmm. a lot of people forge friendship. Yeah. From different countries on the five day, they still meet each other and mm-hmm. they still talk on, on WhatsApp. That's the beauty of it's a, the bread right? team there. Oh, yeah. And, <laughs> I, make, I, I, make, I, make them, I make them compete <laughs> with each other. <laughs> I love that. No. So many of the clients all make doors. Table one is better than table two. Ah, yeah. <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's, uh, you make it fun. Is mm. it profitable to have a bakery in UK nowadays? No. No? I don't think so. Mm. As for the amount of work you put into it, it's very hard to make money. Unless you get the brand. You do it for your love, but I tell you what, love can become... I always see no. the people who come in here to open the bakery. I, I said to them on the Monday, I would put, I'd do everything to put you off. <laughs> Because if you go for it and you do a success of it, well done. But it, 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 with bread, I see there's very little value in bread. Okay? Yes. The value is in your brand. Yes. Like many things. You know, people start with chocolate. There's so many chocolate brands. Why would you, as Mr. Nobody, become Mr. Chocolate? You've got to be clever on marketing. You got to, it's not just making good bread. You've got to have, you know, you can have 10 books behind you yeah. if you're not pushing or whatever. It's really, really hard. And there, are there bakeries, for example, that uh, get a uh, freeze bread at the first uh, time of the day and then they frozen bake it? Bread. Uh, fr- frozen bread, sorry. And instead of baking and doing it by themselves, they buy it frozen and then they, they I'm bake I'm sure they will be. Hmm. But, you know, it's a, I think if you open a bakery, you've got to be smart. So you've got to understand the whole bakery system. You've got to be able to, to provide very fresh bread every time, every time, all the day. Mm. So you got to understand our dough work. You know, if I open the bakery again, I just mm-hmm. use cold dough. Mm-hmm. I would just use cold dough and bake it every hour. Yeah. Straight from the fridge. Yes. No problem. 
the concept to, to find people to work all night now. Mm. Bakers are different species. Yeah. Yes. So unless you work all night with them, which you can't do because you're, you're, you're crazy, to, you're able to touch them, inspire them to believe what you're doing, to do it the same. But, you know, human nature, we try to cut corners all the time. That's a <laughs> human nature. So I think unless you do it yourself all the time, but you burn out, you know. I could yes. never see myself working in the bakery for the next 20 years. I was just no chance. Yeah. So you got to find a method that you... I see the problem with many bakeries, they try to do too many things. They do 20 bread. <sighs> Why? You don't bake for yourself. You bake yeah. for you bake for yourself, you don't bake for people. It's just you know, Mrs. Smith want one loaf of bread a yeah. day. You know, just you, that, you, you will lose money doing that. Yeah. You've got to simplify, make three good things. I always say to everybody yes. who opens a bakery, make three good things that people recognize you for. Mm-hmm. When I opened a bakery, I did three good things. A good focaccia. Fo- what? <laughs> focaccia. Focaccia. <laughs> no. You, you do porn. You know, that's a new, you <laughs> do porn. That's our new channel we open. Yeah. That's you the one we open after porn. Excellent. I'm going to reach this other tonight. A good focaccia, because people in England love a soft bread with olive oil. No. A good sourdough, because it was fashionable. And mm. a good almond croissant. Uh, ah, almond croissant. No baguette? No, because baguette is good, no chef life. Mm, yeah. So you've got to be smart. You've know, mm. you got to make things that, you yeah. know, if you make croissant, you can use them again. Yeah. Okay, so... And I knew if I do those three good, then I have a chance. Yeah. And then we build up our bakery around those three foundations. Yeah. Stuff. All yeah. the rest came around it. Yeah. So Excellent. making baguettes, we made 40 baguettes a day. That's it. People don't buy baguettes like we do in France. Yeah. So what's the point of doing this in England? Yeah. They don't come in the morning and say, oh, I need my baguette at 6 o'clock in the yeah, morning. Yeah. Come it's back a fresh baked baguette. No. No. They come on Monday mm. and come back on Friday. My baguette was still yesterday. So yeah. It's Thursday. We need to buy it Monday. <laughs> it's normal. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it's you've got to adapt to where you live. Yeah, not make baguette because you're French. Yeah, it's stupid. Mm, I understand. So and taking okay. all of this in account, how do you see the future of baking in the next years? I think pff, next year is going to be very hard in England because the cost of the energy has gone up. Yeah. The cost of ingredients has gone up. Mm. Uh, I think the the big fashion of micro bakery. Who opened the past 10 years, mm. you know, micro bakery, you just, yeah. uh, you know, you get, um, you make 10 of a day or something like that. A lot of them were going to find the cost of surviving very, very hard. It was so, so micro, micro that you won't even see them. No, they, <laughs> they become <laughs> they so micro. <laughs> it's, it's a shame because a lot of people got a passion mm. and they, mm. I think when you, you make 10 of a day and you, yeah. you make 20 pounds out of it, you say, well, if I do 500 of them, I make a lot of money. To understand, to make 10 love to 500, yeah. the storage space you need for that, the yeah. planning you need for that, the understanding the investment. you have, investment, everything else. It's mm. huge. And so if you're going to spend 50 grand to do a place up for mm. selling bread, that's a lot of love for bread to sell for you to make money, to repay your 50 grand investment. Yeah. If you employ somebody, it will take you four years to really repay yourself. Mm-hmm. So um. it's... You know, unless you have the brand name to be able to sell your bread mm. at a good price, good luck. Mm-hmm. So I always say to people, make pizza, you make more money with pizza than you mm. do with bread you love for bread. Yeah, mm-hmm. sure. If you make famine, make some crackers, good chef life, you make a lot of money than mm-hmm. the loaf of bread. It would take 24 hours to make. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you've got to know your market, I think, and mm. choose one or two products. You can do a lot of it. It's got a good chef life. Bread's got no yeah. chef life. It's a crazy mo- business model. You make something that you don't sell on a day, it goes in the bin the next day, or you have to make a byproduct out of it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's mad. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's, uh, but you know, if people still buy bread and understand it, there's still be some life out of it. But you know, it's, I think it's a, it's a very hard business to go into. Okay, okay. Well, Richard, thank you very much for having, having this conversation with having you. Having you in, in our, I know, th- having, <laughs> <laughs> no, having you in my kitchen, thank you. <laughs> There's no more wine for you. Wow. you. But I came for the lunch. <laughs> yeah, lunch was earlier. Thank you for baking. Yeah. Don't stick to him. <laughs> now, uh, thank you, Richard. You're a genius. Thank no, you for having pleasure. us. Thank you. You've opened your kitchen for us for a lot of hours, not just this podcast. And no, thank you. Really incredible. You can follow him on his YouTube channel. 
Non. <rire> Adorable YouTube channel, ça. <rire> Non, On va avoir un now. <laughs> Maybe. Youdoporn.com. <laughs> now, his Instagram. And of course, visiting him at his kitchen and learning from him because it's the boss, the mm. bread boss, the dough boss. A, a big applause for Richard Tinnett. Thank you. Gracias.